Welcome to Not Tough and Pilot with Penny Bradley. Today I have Matt Tracy back. And we've covered the technical aspects. So now we're going to cover some of the other stuff from Nachtwaffen. The context for this is, okay, y'all know I have some abilities. I can do little things that sometimes help people. And sometimes it blows up in my face. And I had this man contact me and he's misunderstood a lot of things all along. He thought I could order Nachtwaffen to come invade earth so that he could be put into a position of authority. And now he's decided that he's cursed by God and he thought I could veto God. Guys. I'm not claiming to be a deity. Nowhere do I have the hubris to say I can veto God on anything. I'm not a religious person, but I'm not going up against the big guy. All right, guys? Chill. So I'm hoping he's the only one with that particular full notion. <laughs> But considering what I get contacted by on a daily basis, Matt and I decided to talk about the real stuff in Nachtwaffen about how spirituality is viewed and what the practices and understandings are. So with that, Matt, you want to start off? Okay, yeah. Um, basically, you know, I've been asked that before. Um, what's the correct religion to follow, you know, that the rest of the universe follows? The answer to that is none of them. A Pretty much. In itself is a brainwashing control mechanism to keep us all divided. And the, that's why there are more than one. They were all created by the same groups of people. Um, yeah, the there. story I was told was that the extraterrestrials that created us as a slave race, basically yeah. they had skin color to determine which ET you belong to and you were taught to worship your owner. Yep. And that later on as the ETs backed off, no they didn't go away. But that all the all the skin colors and the religions all mixed together and gee, people were competitive. Oh yeah. And what I was told in Nachtwaffen was that religion, because it was a mind control device, was the cause of most misery on earth. Most of the wars that were started were on religious differences. Or at least that's the excuse they gave the people. That's what the people were fighting over. The real reasons were competition between the rulers. Right. So it's, it's, you look at it and the guys at the top are actually making money off of our deaths. Yep. And, they, and, they and they're, today. they're still finding excuses today to make money off of our deaths. Uh huh. Actually, there's a really big problem in the world right now. That's about people making money off of our deaths. Like I said earlier before the, before we started recording, those are the two biggest problems on earth. One is religion and two is the monetary system. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have either one of those in Nachtwaffen. Out there in space, um, save for the ICC, who are depicted in Star Trek as the Ferengi. Yep. 
<laughs> Everybody else doesn't worry about money. Just the Ferengi. Yep. Or as the Germans call them, Bunker im Weltheim, which translates into bankers in space. Yep. So if they're bankers in space, that's their whole attitude, is it? Money, 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 money. I think Lisa Minnelli had a song about that. It, it, the German word for banker sounds so much like the word we use for bunkers. Mm -hmm. You wonder if that's the actual origin of that word. You've gone bonkers. Um, it would fit. I know the word in English comes from the bank of a river because you would you would dig a hole in the bank of the river and hide your money in it. Yeah. So. Um, um, but yeah, out there in space, there is no religion. There is the understanding of spirit, spirituality, the spiritual realm, the astral plane is on a level of it being a, an exact science. Mm -hmm. It's an exact science that we use to use hyperspace to be able to travel anywhere. It's just a certain version of, of science and the practice of magic out there is really just us activating our metagene and the science of how the human mind accesses that energy. Mm -hmm. It's energy manipulation, that yeah. pure and simple. And whether you do it through a machine on earth or whether you do it through more esoteric means in, in a black op, it's still energy manipulation. And the techniques used, the techniques themselves are not good or evil. It's just like a gun sitting on the table. That's not good or evil. That's a tool. A knife can be used for so many different things. It, it's a tool. Mm -hmm. It's not good or evil. It's the person wielding it who decides what he's going to use it for. Well, I have found that good and evil are in the eyes of the beholder. Yep. Everybody out there thinks they're the good guys and that the good they want to accomplish justifies the evil they do to accomplish it. And that's basically the human condition in space in a nutshell. That's the human condition on earth as well. I mean, just yeah. take a look at things, you know. Well, we have to do it this way. Well, why? Because it's the way that we get this result. Well, what about all these people that you hurt in the process? Well, they don't matter. Why don't they matter? Well, because we want this result. And that that's the exact rationing, rational thought process that everybody goes through with almost everything they plan to do. Most people don't even think about who it's going to hurt. It's like uh, some of these um, guys that I've spoken with, um, a couple of them in particular, I won't name names, but they there's their strongest memories is of um the united states um space marines hmm. and they've so bought into the brainwashing rhetoric that they're the good guys everyone else is the bad guys every reptilian you ever come across is is a draco and all dracos are evil and i've heard that from a lot of people and it's just not true not uh, not. some something that i hear from religious people is that reptilians don't have a soul 
That's also every, not true. Every organic being has a soul, even uh -huh. the non sentient beings. Every animal, every plant, every organic being has a, has a connection, has a spiritual self on the astral plane. This is true. And no, we didn't we didn't collude on this one. This is we both got it from the same black we were both educated by the same people in space. Yeah. And there is, if you go through physics, quantum mechanics, and you look at from the highest to the lowest level for quantum mechanics, you never find a particle or a field that you can label consciousness. Consciousness is an effect of the energy that makes up the universe. The universe itself is both alive and conscious, and so is every part of it, right down to the subatomic particles right down to the the static quantum field that holds it all together and it boggles my mind that so many people think that other sentient beings don't have a soul it's like what what we were taught um that other what we were educated on we were educated on um, in, in school out there, multiple different viewpoints, and viewpoints that we were told by other races mm -hmm. that much older races had come to conclusions on or were still running this theory or that theory. Um, but they just had far more information to base that theory on than we do here on earth. What they, what a lot of them had a similar continuity in was the universe itself is in and of itself a sentient living being that is infinitesimally smaller than a larger whole, that there are other universes out there and the, the largest being consciousness out there they still can't even fathom are the oldest race we've ever had contact with still can't even fathom the largest being in that beyond the cosmos um so the idea that god is infinite is is running theory um the idea is that this being is that our universe is is a smaller part of a larger whole and it itself has smaller parts in it galaxies solar systems it goes all the way down to individual molecules mm -hmm. and what it is and those molecules will coalesce and start to experience existence as you know the way we understand existence and the what their common running theme is, is that the greatest part of this being is dividing itself ever and ever more so that it can experience itself in every single possible way. So fractals exploring um, Existence, probability theory of its own existence. And we are simply a infinitesimally small fractal of that larger fractal experiencing itself. And that's why some of the fractals are positive polarity and some of them are negative polarity is because it wants to experience both. Even, I, I tried explaining this to you know christians does it your your idea of what is evil is pain and suffering 
What did that pain and suffering cause in you? If all you ever experienced was light and joy and peace, you would never have pushed yourself to rise yeah. above it. You would never have pushed yourself to be better than you are now. You would never have sought other experiences. Uh, there's, there there's, is no balance in between the push and pull of, you know, of all that. There is no experience. There's a book and it's called The People of the Lie. And it's written by a Christian, uh, if I remember right, his last name's Peck but I may be wrong about that. And he's, he's a Christian and he's a licensed clinical psychologist. And the book is a collection of case studies of people he judged to be evil. That was their clinical diagnosis at the end. They were just evil. And, um, his working definition from the book boils down to they don't care the effects of their actions on others, even when those effects are pointed out to them. That was his working definition for evil. It wasn't whether they killed people. It wasn't whether they... they did horrific things. It was, did they care the effects of their own actions on others? And he- Like a toddler to me. In a lot of ways, yeah, it's a toddler. Um, what if this was just a young soul that's only just beginning to experience life in a sentient form? Exactly. And my I understanding- Wisdom to understand any more than that. My understanding from extraterrestrials is that Earth was a nursery for baby souls to learn how to live in physical form. So they expected that we would go through all the stages of exploring life. Right. And that we would eventually learn how to play well with others. And so what I find looking around with, with this idea is there are a lot of baby souls. These are the folks that are being labeled as non-players, organic portals, uh, bodies without souls. Well, they have a soul. It's just an infant. It's an infant soul. It's only recently started experiencing life on this level. Maybe mm -hmm. that person was a dog recently, or or an ape, or a bear, and they evolved to the point where finally they can't fit in the uh, the meat sacks that they were previously incarnating in. Now they had to go into something, you know, with a larger volume, you know, that can that can handle their evolved state. Well, the next step up is human, Homo sapien. Yeah. The other thing that the ETs told me, uh, by the way, this came from Mantids, um, is that once the galaxy figured out there was a nursery with a soul trap, that they figured out they could exile their criminals, their dissidents, their deposed rulers, their, their troublemakers, and even their super too good people, because super too good people can be a pain in the ass too. Yeah. And, and they, they took all of these divergent types and exiled them here too. Because if you die here, you're stuck with the soul trap. And this particular soul trap is set where you have to be 52% service to others to leave. So our entire culture is set up on service to self. Isn't it? Yeah. 
So you have a bunch of people, be, you have a bunch of souls that are here that nobody can leave until they're 52% service to others. Oh, you have company. No, yep, that's Princess Leia. So, um, beautiful. So, um, that's one of the things that I've had to try to explain to people. And lately, it's become an issue for me because I have people in my world who are dehumanizing others for whatever quality they've chosen to hate. And it makes me wonder why they choose the qualities that they do, because, you know, back in the day, it was people that didn't follow your religion. And now it's activities that are considered criminal, and they, these people should be able to be arrested and locked up. But that isn't good enough for these folks. And the level of rage coming off of them really worries me. Well, I'll be honest. I have an un almost uncontrollable rage for the people who did what they did to me. Mm -hmm. um, as far as physically, I do believe in defending yourself and if need be, with lethal force, if it will never cease. Um, that's just a fact of life. That's part of mm -hmm. this existence. You have to have the right to defend yourself. Um, but I'm not sure I completely despise them. It's more like I, I have a strong pity for them because the people that did what they did to me were just as brainwashed as what they were turning me into. Well, that's, that's part of how I got past my initial rage. When, when the memories came back, I wanted to kill. I mean, I admit it. Uh, I'm well, still there. I, what, I what happened? Where I want to go out and, and hurt one of these people. But um, as I've done more research, I found out that most of the perps were victims themselves when they were younger. And that actually confused me emotionally. It is very confusing. It's like they're both the criminal and the victim at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, and 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 I want what I want the audience to understand: the people that kidnap us, traffic us, torture and mind fracture us, rape us, all of that was done to them too. At this point, we're not dealing with people who chose that way of life we're dealing with people who were just as programmed as we are mm -hmm. and some of them that's an altar that just like us they're they're sent back into their normal life and some of them remember and some of them try to commit suicide because of what they what they remember having done just destroys them i have trouble living with some of the memories that have come up um, some of the memories of using my psionic abilities to destroy worlds. Those, those haunt me. Entire worlds gone because I was ordered. And yet when orders were threatening me, I stood up and said no. But I followed the orders to destroy an entire planet of innocent people. No, they were not humans, but they were still sentient beings in physical bodies. Every single sentient person, every single being out there has just as much right to exist as you and me. Just because they have scales on their dermal layer instead of skin, 
doesn't make them any less having a right to exist. Just I agree with that. Culture is, is developed in a different manner doesn't mean they have any less right to live the way they want to live. The only problem I begin to have is when us or them start to impose their ideals onto somebody who doesn't want them. Yeah. Who doesn't want those ideals. And we do that out there at every turn. We impose our ideals, we impose our way of life on the people who don't want it. And we yeah. kill them if they say no. Yeah. Well, we do that on Earth too. That's what a lot of these, this these is invasions of third world countries are about. This is why everybody that's got colonies out there, out past the solar system, past the ore cloud, is being sent back by the galactic authority, by the guardians. Mm -hmm. Because we don't play nice. No. We don't live in peace with We're anyone. Not, we not come not, in, we yeah. come into town, we take over, we bully everybody. Those who, who submit, we put into slavery. Those who don't submit, we kill. And the ones that we- Or find a use for them. Take their pineal gland out, put it in a robot body. Yeah. Which is absolute torture. I have a memory. I don't have memory of that altar. I only have memory of my body being torn apart in a facility on Mars. And I remember the pain. You, you, you know that, that the whole Cybermen from Doctor Who, they're, they're mm -hmm. screaming and everything while this is all happening. I remember shit like that happening on Mars. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have an I altar that has been put into a robot body. And all she does is fly a shuttle between the moon and Mars on a regular schedule. And she- They don't predate you or numb you when they no. do it. They just no. start ripping and cutting and- they, they do all this with you awake and no numbing and- You're when actually you, hanging on hooks while they're doing it. Oh yeah, they'll just store you hanging on hooks. They and they don't even, like, they have technology to just let you float there, but no, they're sadists. They, they will, they hang you on hooks like you're just a pile of meat. Yeah, and that's actually what they use most of the leftover parts for is, is food. Food, food for the races that still eat humans. So we are being sold by our own kind and if we're doing that to our own kind, what are we doing to the others? Right. You have, you have to think about the galaxy is out there with all teeming with Other life. Other programs think they're, think they're nice and okay because they're not the ones physically committing the act of doing that, but they're condoning by letting it happen and then buying the product from yeah. the because the ICC are the ones that are actually doing that. Yeah. I keep hearing well, about, oh, it's product. it's the Germans, it's the Germans. No, it's ICC, ICC is doing that. The bankers in space that are doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, they go, they are the ones that are taking all of all of the captured refugees. In fact, the folks that are being sent back to the solar system by the guardians when they come through the sun. And that's what this, I, I forget her last name. Her first name is Gina. She has a YouTube with quarter million followers and she posts these pictures of ships coming out of the sun. Those are German ships. The big round spheres. That's the field generators of the ships. Yeah. The ship inside the sphere. So you've got, she's got physical proof of what we're talking about. These ships are coming through the sun. These are refugees being sent back to the solar system by the guardians. They started with the Germans because they're the farthest out. So it's like scoop everybody in. The rim of this arm of the galaxy. Yeah, we're all the way out. 
And so they, they are scooping us in from the outermost part first and bringing us back into the solar system. And instead of invading Earth, they have found empty planet planetoids in the in the Oort cloud and they're forming cities underground. And yes, there are asteroid, you know, planetoids in the Oort cloud, some as large as Mars. Yes. And so what they're doing is they're settling there rather than come back into Earth. Now these are people, human beings that were originally from Earth. Stop. They are just Germans. They're pure Germans. They're not hybrided with anything. They, they always disapproved of that in space. Us who got hybridized with draconian DNA um, before the Germans basically, you know, took possession, um, they would never let us interbreed. No. In societies. I was, they called me Miskabert, like it was my name. Um, I've been called be on it because it's not technically an abortion that lived. What it means is that you're born deformed. But the implication out there was that you're an abortion that lived. Something absolutely so messed up that you don't have a right to live. And that was what they called me instead of my name. So yeah, I have that down, down clear. You had to be pure bred Terran human to be worthwhile. But then, you know, even they, their idea is obscured because there is no pure blooded human. No, there's not. There was, there never was. The first humans were hybrids. The first humans, in my understanding, were were hybrids between one of several extraterrestrial races and the creature known as Homo erectus. Now, along the way, there have been something like twenty-two different variations. Some of them did better than others. But they were looking for a version that was strong enough and smart enough to do the work, but dumb enough to not rebel. The way I understood it was that the Jahami first made the first hybrid humans, 50% um, primate, 50% Shahami, and then later on other races came in, about 21, 22 of them came in and asked permission to make modifications, um, run experiments, and they made modifications to us. This is why we have webbed hands, you know, our knuckles all the way down here. Primates don't have this webbing. We have webbing. Um, mm -hmm. Primates can't handle the amount of salt we can handle. We handle just as much salt as any ocean faring mammal handles. And we have to, and we have to have that much salt to live. Yeah, we get dehydrated, ser seriously de dehydrated. Even, even primates don't sweat through their skin, but we do. We sweat through our skin just like ocean faring mammals. There was a theory back in the 70s that our version of humanity survived the ice age by becoming aquatic. Uh, I don't. That that was their explanation for the body type being so different from. Because those people didn't want to accept the fact that we're hybrids. Exactly. <laughs> an amalgamation of different hybrids that well, suddenly once we started having the ability to travel in sh um, shorter time frames longer distances you know the hybridizations that were once you know unique to that region started intermingling with the rest of the planet and now we're all just a mix of one pot 
Yeah, the last the last study I I ran across said that there was less genetic diversity in all of humanity now than in a single troop of chimpanzees running around in a forest. That we actually don't have enough genetic diversity that all it would take is one or two major diseases to come through and it would wipe out most of us. Yeah, I can believe that. And yet we quibble over differences that genetically don't amount to anything. Any, to anything at all. Um, so what, what was the next part? Oh, yes. Um, the guardians. <clears throat> I get asked a lot about the guardians because there's someone out there who has made them sound like they are humanity's saviors. And I get a lot of folks telling me that what I know about them is wrong because this other person has, has talked and talked and talked and talked and turned them into something of a, a religion. Okay, the guardians that I know, and yeah, I do know some, they are individuals from different species from different worlds. Um, there is a government in the core of the galaxy. And when they speak to me, it's telepathically and I hear it in English rather than whatever language they're thinking in. And it comes to me as galactic authority. I don't know if you've heard that term or not. I've used that term on other interviews. I didn't know where I got it from. It's just, it, it fit. Now, Galactic Authority is the real name of the government of the core of the galaxy. And the guardians are their- Police force. Military police. Yeah. When, when there's a world that's not following galactic law, these are the guys that show up in your sky. These are the guys who enforce the law. These are the guys who make the arrests. And then there is a regional court for each part of space. Ours is operated by, they call it the Council of Five. It's five different five different races and they're extremely strict harsh even isn't there a base orbiting what is it saturn they have a they have a hyperspace bubble yeah so it's not real visible and yeah the court itself is in the hyperspace bubble and it's orbiting saturn and the guardians have a base on saturn and that's why everybody on Earth thinks that Saturn is about authority. Because the military police are there. And why no humans are allowed in that space. No humans are allowed there at all, unless they no are there faction. to be. No human faction that I know of is allowed in Saturn orbit without an invitation. Exactly because they are the representatives of the galactic government. And there are some folks out there that will argue about this. And I, I swear there are people that would argue just to argue. There's one particular drug addict that argues just to argue. And no, I'm not going to name him, he has enough in enough people who listen to him already. Um, you know who I mean. <laughs> Definitely good at bringing tension out of you. Yeah. I mean by you, I mean by anybody, including me. 
Yeah. Uh, there are folks in this community that are damaged and cause problems without meaning to. There are also folks in this community who are damaged and cause problems on purpose. So the folks that cause problems on purpose, I avoid like the plague. You will never, ever, ever see those people on my show. <laughs> I don't care how much Daryl wants them. They're not coming. The folks who are damaged and cause trouble by accident, they're real, real veterans. And they're, as long as they're telling the truth, I might have them on. But the folks that, that are causing problems on purpose, nope. Um, that's my personal bias. Uh, our community, the people have enough, enough damage that we don't need problems on purpose. You're sitting there like, ooh, I hit a but Penny got triggered. <laughs> no, I'm just letting you have your... Uh your space, your, uh, your moment. Yeah. Um, to be said. There are a lot of people in our community who are operating on partial memory. <coughs> Excuse me. And I give them space to remember more. I'm not judging them for operating on partial memories. What they remember was real. It just isn't the whole story. I get upset about the ones who take their partial memory and think it's the full story and they're singing a hero song. Yeah. They, they're that singing a hero really, song. That really irks my chain. It's like, no, we we're not heroes. We didn't if, use this. And not only that, we're not doing good out there. We're doing very selfish things out there and hurting everyone we come across. Yeah. And at that point, I get told, well, isn't there somebody that's going to come rescue us? Rescue us? What about the <laughs> we're hurting? What, who's going to rescue them from us? Uh, the, the, there are some really good people that have been really badly treated by humans in space. Yes. And... Everyone else is standing back, shocked, going, oh, my God, <laughs> or their planet's equivalent of it. And I don't know of anyone out there other than the Guardians that see any reason for us to even continue to exist. And the Guardians are only doing it because they see our race as toddlers. Race that just doesn't know any better. Um, one of these species that was hurt in particular are the mantids on Mars. I mean, they used to have ships, they used to be in space, and Germans come along and say, we want your land, and they bomb them back into the Stone Age, literally. Yeah, we, we did that to the raptors on Mars, too. Yeah. Um, so there are two species on two two spacefaring intelligent races on Mars that we bombed them back into the Stone Age. As far as the raptors go, you know, they hunted humans for food. Um, the mantids had nothing, we had nothing against them at all. They were very nice and inviting mm -hmm. and we destroyed almost just completely destroyed them and mm -hmm. the fact that they would link up to my telepathic ping that one time evaluate me and literally say we forgive you we'll invite you back if you can make it here you people that are listening don't understand how big a deal that is because yeah. you don't really know what we did to them this is how nice and peaceful these beings are. If you're not, if you're not actively a threat, they have no desire to harm you in any way. 
Yeah, um, I'll never forget the one group that contacted me for help. Um, their particular species had been involved in a war and literally all that was left was six ships. And they asked me to make contact with uh, the German high command to see if a planet would be made available to them. Well, guys, I did not do this by telepathy. I did not go through my altar to do this. I happen to know people on earth who are part of high command in their altars. And I, I talked to them, said, this is going on. If you can, see if you can help them. This wasn't a matter of, oh, Uber Commando, you, you must do this. No, this was networking. Basic human on earth networking through social media okay i don't want anybody to think that i have the power to tell high command what to do i don't i passed on a suggestion through channels well they ended up get, being given their planet and they were they were grateful but I will never forget that initial contact when they thought they were summoning a demon. That, that has stuck with me. That's how we're all viewed out there. You know, we've got people in the community who all refer to the Germans as demons and they praise themselves and sing their hero song there isn't a single faction out there that isn't just as harmful to the environment yeah. or, or worse. There are, there are groups that are worse. ICC is worst among, above them all. ICC will go through and destroy a culture, strip, strip a world of all of its resources. And when it is finally down to bare, unusable rock. They'll blow it up for target practice. The movie um, Avatar. The Avatar is exactly not, what ICC I does. Not, um, I would not... Um, um, I would believe that that was based on a true story. Yeah. I would believe that, that was that based on a true story. That was an ICC operation... And they hired, they contracted both Kruger and Monarch um, contractors to do the job. And that's what they do. They go in, they take whatever resources, they mow whoever gets in their way down and they don't waste anything. They'll take them and turn them into controllable cyborgs they'll sell their bodies off to um, other sentient races that still eat other sentient races. They will never let anything go to waste. Um, I don't believe I've shared this in any of my interviews, but I had a summer I think it was 2017 when every time I went to sleep, I was on this world that had these huge, huge trees and the primary species had evolved from flying squirrels. And basically whatever group I was part of, was going through and cutting the trees. And my job was to teach these flying squirrels agriculture because we were destroying their ecology 
and it was my job to make sure they would survive. Uh, and the the faction, I don't know which one it was, but it could have been any of them. I think that particular group spoke English. So I, I have memories of being in Kruger. I don't have memories of being in the others. Um, there are people who remember me from Solar Warden. But yeah, uh, so um, I somehow learned these beings language and I'm telepathic enough that we were able to communicate and I got them seeds from earth and uh, not GMO <laughs> and taught them basic agriculture and how to companion plant and what things to eat together to get a full protein and you know basic 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 stuff and I remember being mortified that they thought of me as a goddess you know like like you hear the mythologies from various native peoples around the world about some being who came from space and, and taught them corn or maize or, or whatever their local grain is. And I, I was mortified to be put in that role, thinking that, that I was some sort of a helper deity whenever all I was doing was making sure they survived after my people screwed them over royally. So yeah, a lot of what, what I have done out there in my own ethics system has been evil as fuck. Yeah. And I have to live with that. And I get really, really, really upset. It, it hurts me inside when people start telling me what a hero I am. I don't feel like a hero. I feel like a monster. So, um, if I'm brought before Osiris and, and Anubis and Mahat, my heart's going to be heavier than that feather. And I know it. So. And as, and as far as the standard Abrahamic faiths, well, I've been kicked out of all forms of Christianity. So you get excommunicated enough times, you get the idea. Another thing I'd like to touch on and get people to understand the ICC is so much worse and more evil than all the other groups combined to such a degree they're the they're the source of the idea of the alliance yeah the whole idea of the alliance is people starting to remember ships from different factions acting and working together what i started remembering i was remembering that too and what i started remembering was us being captured by icc controlled ships and being reprogrammed to obey them mm -hmm. yeah i had i i never remembered battles or or joining them i remembered seeing people who were dead having all of their their all of their enhancements all of their their chips removed and replaced with ICC chips before they were reanimated and those chips are what cause you to 
not disobey. Yeah. Well, um, people have seen my my show with with um, Joseph Powell, where he talked about that his altar went nuts and was going to to bomb Washington D.C. And I stopped him. And I was getting us out of there. We were captured by ICC. And I was held for about a week inside a psionic cage where I could not use my abilities. And inside this psionic cage, I was in a straitjacket. And there was a man who is public, claims to be part of Alliance, and I'm not going to name him. I haven't talked to him. I don't know if he remembers this or not. But he was coming in several times a day and beating the hell out of me for hours on end with me in a straitjacket and a side cage where I could not defend myself. Well, I have some interdimensionals who like me because of my soul mission. And they noticed that I was off the grid. They couldn't find me. So they hunted me down by last known whereabouts and they found me in this cage. And one of them is a fire elemental and she melted the side cage and cut the straps on the straight jacket. And in my rage at how he had treated me, I blew up his head and I left him dead next to the melted pile of the side cage. And I don't know if I did it myself or if the fire elemental helped me, but I took all of our people from the 20 ships that we had there. I took all of our people out of the ICC prison, put us back on our ships and we headed back into German space. And um, I had asked Joseph Salter if he wanted to come with us and he said no. So I was leaving him there. And he has said he's on one of the ships. He hears my voice over the intercom. I don't know how he got there. But I sent a report. Everything. To both High Command with the Germans. And the Draco Queen Mother. And basically I said that if... German High Command wanted to investigate this incident that I wanted the people to be interrogated by a Draco instead of the usual methods that we had already been through hell that the Draco could pop in, read everything, pop out, no harm done. And that they would get their answer with nothing withheld. So that was finally accepted when we got back into German space. That was the approach that was taken. And yeah, people are going to be shocked that, that I recommended a Draco do the interrogation. Draco are far more honorable than people have been taught and led to believe. Yeah, they are. And, and they are more... Um, less invasive than some people want to describe. That field that will actually melt a person's brain, that's just their natural psionic field that surrounds them. That's not them actively doing that. Yeah, uh, I've tried to explain that it's just, you're not hardwired for their energy. Your energy isn't dense enough of, of theirs. They're far older, mm -hmm. far, far older. Well, I've been told, well, they're low 
low vibe regressives. And I'm like, excuse me, have you been around one? <laughs> they're far higher vibration. Their, their energy field is so much denser than our own. Our body, our physical brains can't handle it and begins to slowly fry and break down. Mm -hmm. The physical mechanics of our brain's neurology if you were to keep a, a normal, a norm, what we call a normie, when you keep a, when you keep a muggle, <laughs> Rico, uh, within about a half hour to 45 minutes, their entire brain will be liquid. Yeah. Someone and it's, it's not brain. intentional on the part of the Draco either. It's completely not intentional. That's just the natural state of his field. And they are, they respect um um the people the humans that they work with enough to where they understand that and they keep their distance because they don't want to hurt us oh that's why they only have the one base on earth and it's in antarctica where they're not likely to interact with normies right and uh, us who have draconian dna added in modified our genetics and our brain chemistry just enough that we have no we some of us will still feel the the physical pressure and need time to adapt but our our brains our bodies our energy fields will adapt within a matter of days it's just like being next to a normal human being again well, I don't remember spending days or weeks on end with them like you did. But um, I remember being able to work beside them on Mars with no problem at all and carry on telepathic conversations and then have to figure out, because they practice full intimacy telepathy, having to figure out what was the appropriate parts to share with my boss who could not be around them see a lot of people who aren't telepathic they're very they cringe at the idea of somebody coming into their mind because there's a lot of very intimate things we think about and things that we don't want other people to to see but see draco because they're so used to it that's what they are, and that's the way they are in their own culture. It doesn't bother them what what you think, what goes on in the background of your mind. You know, things you think are bad thoughts you don't want other people to see. They're used to all that. They want mm -hmm. a full, open, intimate mind because their culture is based on absolute honesty. Mm -hmm. No deception. Any deception is considered one of the highest forms of dishonor. That's true. Uh, yeah, the problem I have living around humans. It's made me wonder. <laughs> the problem I have living around humans is they will think one thing and say another and have a third set that's their emotional status. And underneath it all, they're thinking about going to the bathroom or what they're going to eat or, damn, I'd like to nail that. <laughs> you know, and, and you have to sort through all the bullshit to even get a whiff of what they're actually thinking. The reason for all of that is because they're not used to other people knowing all that. They're, they're used to thinking they're alone in their heads and that no one else hears it. And they're broadcasting all of this 24-7. In a society where almost everything is done between telepathic connection and a full openness and honesty of that connection when you're in that kind of culture, the way you think changes because yeah. what you think um, affects the people around you. It does. It affects their view of you. It affects how they interact with you. It affects how you interact with them. Um, so you're going to learn very quickly how to be more honorable and respectful with your thoughts. Exactly. 
uh, as I've remembered more, I'm finding myself being in more of what you would call a Zen state. Yeah. Where all of this stray bullshit doesn't come through. A lot of my mental um, thought process, I must just be used to it because I don't think in words. I don't think audibly. I only think visually. And I do a lot of that. I can shut all that down. And then what I'm thinking is pure sensory input. Mm -hmm. When I shut that down, my mind isn't empty. It's taking in the environment. I'm not speaking in my inner voice at all. I'm just standing in that space. <laughs> but I've still got thoughts going on in the background. Have you ever been in a space where your mouth is opening and you're going to talk, but you have no idea what's going to come out? Uh, I'm not sure how what you mean by that. It's like, you're not thinking thoughts and words, but you know, you're going to talk. I've had, but I've been, I want to say something, but my brain goes completely blank. Um, this has been happening more and more over the past few months where I will just start talking and it. I have no idea what is coming out until I hear it with everybody else. And it's like, Oh, oh. <laughs> you know what? I think I may have had that happen a good number of times, you know, with my parents. Okay. I'll say something, and then they're like, you just said this. Wait, what? What did I say? <laughs> um, on that note, going to work, I, I, it's about a 50 minute drive to work then a 50 minute drive home and it's anywhere from a 25 minute to an hour drive from work to the area I deliver in. Um, between in those time frames of just driving, my, my brain starts to zone out to the point where it all of a sudden I'll start blacking out and I have to like grab the wheel again. And it, I, at first I was thinking when this happens at first, I was thinking that I'm not sleeping enough. I'm passing out, but then I started noticing there are th things going on that aren't akin to falling asleep or being too tired. Like suddenly I'll just, I'll take one hand and just start pumping it. Just having a physical activity. All of a sudden I'm completely 100% coherent. So I'm wondering if that is more of an altar trying to take over. It could be. Um... It could be a situation where your brain doesn't have enough sensory input. I mean, we are wired different. Aren't we? I would, I would think so. So um, I have episodes <clears throat> that are probably alter related where I will just suddenly just start nodding off in the middle of a conversation. That's that's kind of the way it feels. It's like I feel like I'm I'm losing consciousness, like passing out. Yeah, that's what it feels like. And most of the time I have enough warning that Lou will take me to bed. And yeah. I actually sleep. So doing a second activity while driving, like just just pumping my hand like this. Yeah. It's enough of an activity to keep me completely coherent. Now, at the conference that we were at, first part of November, there was a lot of memory input for all of us because we were there. We, we would, would sit at the table together to eat. We were sharing stories. We had very few muggles with us. <laughs> the, ones that, the ones that were there were folks who had heard our stories and knew what we were. And so we were sharing memories, sharing war stories. And I would notice that some of us, especially the ones that are newer to memory recall, were having problems with drifting out. 
And uh, so I would look them in the eyes and call their name and they'd come or snap right out of it. But uh, I know that when it's happening, I start getting a pressure in my head. Okay, the pressure in your head is probably related to an altar. It, it, they always coincide with each other and it's almost every day now when I'm driving to work, drive to my route, drive back to the terminal, drive back home. It's those, it's those long drives where it, my mind is able to zone out. Mm. I, you know, where I just don't have enough sensory input to keep myself active. Yeah. It's I'll start to, I'll start feeling this pressure. And when I'm feeling this pressure, I'll start to doze, you know? Yeah. Um, last year, about this time, I was having a really hard time with alters shifting on me. I've noticed that um, if I'm listening to certain songs uh, in my headset or on the radio, um, it gets worse. It gets so strong that I've almost run off the road. Uh, music was used in our programming. Uh, I found out that the problem that I was having last year was because of a book I, I had read. Um, so you need to be careful about some of the occult or esoteric material because this was written by Saint, the real Saint Germain. It's the Most Holy Trina Sophia. That and website the link you sent me i still have it up on my google page it just kind of sits there this whole time <laughs> wow um it's a ritual that's supposed to connect you to your higher self and it's the story of the ritual and it's what you're reenacting as the ritual and i'm sitting there and i'm reading it and when i read it it was like i was shifting shifting altars like a rolodex and i was i was like that for i guess about seven or eight months and it got really bad um and I finally had an encounter with, I guess it's a part of my mind. It shows someone from my past as its appearance, dressed in these white clothes and, and told me, I'm your reset button. <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> higher self. Um, comes to me as one of my past life selves. Oh, this was a guy I had a crush on in high school. My and this me, poor, this my poor boy survived. Was a member of the Guardians. Uh, this this poor boy survived three years of me having a crush on him. Oh wow! And as an adult, I am deeply, deeply humiliated that I did this to him. So. Um, this was before sexual harassment was considered a thing, but yeah, I was, I was out of line. And um, so this, whatever it was, appeared to me and said, I'm your reset button. And the problem you're having is because you did a ritual to connect to your higher self and you don't really have one. Yeah. So it was, we have to deal with the situation. What would you like us to do with all the memories of these altars? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, it would be nice to keep the memories of all of the altars and to reintegrate them so that I have full memory without missing time. And it was, well, do you want them to be pure unprocessed or do you want them to be like old memories that don't hurt? And I said, old memories that don't hurt would be nice. <laughs> and it's, it, that was 
February, March. And I've been slowly regaining the memories. I haven't noticed the new altars popping up as, as, you know, personalities that, but it's, it, I'm getting a sense of wholeness that I haven't had for a long time. So, um, you know, I so have, if you have something I pop up and, and tell a few lines of it so far, but I if keep you it up there for some reason, if you have something pop up and tell you that it's your reset button, take it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. I think it must be uh, really important to me because I've never taken it off my search engine. I keep a window open just for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've only read a few lines and then I haven't messed with it since. Um, I had a hard time reading it. I know I read the whole thing. I know it took me about 40 minutes to read the whole thing. But I only have memory of about 10% of it. I don't even remember what I read, but that's normal for me. Uh, it's, it's a story about this guy who goes on a journey starts off with someone and and ends up alone and there's a river and a bunch of a bunch of weird stuff along the way there's something that he eats that lasts him the rest of the journey and it's uh, okay it's all mystical symbols and and the cult different colors here, there, and the other, and I'm looking at it like, mm -hmm. okay, I clearly do not have the background to understand this document. <laughs> so, yes, guys, I admit I don't know everything. <laughs> so, I mean, it doesn't surprise you, does it? No. Uh, those folks that I talk to on an ongoing and regular basis, I tend to be confused a lot. I tend to freak out over things that happen for the first time. Sometimes freak out over things that happen for the 50th time. <laughs> um, I rely on my friends a lot. And when one of them goes batshit, it really hurts me. And I've had someone I cared about go batshit about every other month the entire time I've been public. And it's, it's getting harder each time. I wish I understood why this was happening. I'm suspecting it has to do with having alters, but I'm not sure. Whenever you have alters and you have missing time and you don't really know what you've said all the time, it makes it hard to be certain about, did I do this or not? So that's a constant, constant in the back of your mind, misgiving about everything is, what did I do to contribute to this situation? So... My whole life, I mean, it wasn't until after I met you that I even discovered I had altars. They just, they stayed so well in the background. I've always had that feeling. I even told you this. I've always, my whole life, felt like somebody was looking through my eyeballs. It's like somebody else was looking through my eyeballs. Um, yeah, I remember you sharing that. And uh, I guess I just didn't want to believe that, that that kind of stuff had happened to me. It's kind of like a defense mechanism, I guess. But once yeah. I finally accepted it, um, things got better um, and worse at the same time. You know? That's a common 
a common thing for me is things get better and worse at the same time about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so my, uh, a lot of my family members still don't believe I have altars. Some of them who have their own uh, understand the, uh, the triggers and the, uh, what's going on. And when I describe it to them, they're like, yep, 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 yep. Uh, I haven't even tried to talk to most of my family. Um, when I went public in 2016, I did one interview with Jay Campbell. And watching it now, it's like, oh, my God, that was a nightmare. I did not do a good job. But the second one with James Rank came out a month or so later and he's he was better at interviewing so we got we got a good we got a good interview and it presented the case and then the next month my son and my nephew showed up at my house and I thought we were having a good visit I remember you telling me this and uh, my son gets up, puts his hands on his hips and says, well, you're clearly delusional, but it's, it's a stable delusion and you're able to handle your own affairs. So I don't think you need to be committed at this time. And my nephew got angry because he thought I did. My nephew has not been welcome at my house since. Um, I told my mom about it. I said, you know, I'm having these memories of things that happened when I was a kid, and I, it explains a lot of what's weird about me, and, you know, I said, so, I told her the names, I said, the, my kid and my nephew showed up, they were going to put me in a nut house. And she says, I don't care what you were talking about. That was uncalled for. It's one of the few times in my life she's ever been supportive. She's generally been whatever, what, whatever someone attacked me about, she was jumping on the bandwagon. But that one, that one got her. And uh, that situation destroyed my relationship with my nephew. And it made it where I no longer trust my family. I have, I have a little brother. Damn, this hair keeps, <laughs> won't stay put. Um, I have a little brother who used to be a big shot in Arizona in their state politics. And we've known, he, we've, we've been in contact for years. And he used to tease me that I was a liberal. I'm not really. I'm in that in between. All I want is the truth and for people to be taken care of. I don't, I don't care about a lot of the other stuff. But he's, he's a staunch conservative. And now that he's retired, he has time on his hands and he's been following what I post on my wall and we've been talking more. And he says, you know, I always knew you had reasons for what you believed, but watching what you post, you make more and more sense the more I watch. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, yeah. my brother said this. <laughs> so yeah, that, yeah, yes, Mike, I actually heard when you said that. <laughs> so, um, but he's, he's in my group. He doesn't say anything in there. Once in a while, he'll click like on something. Uh, James Rink asked him once if he had memories and he just clicked like. Um, he was in the Air Force and he was stationed in Hawaii for a long time. My dad was stationed in Hawaii when he was in the army. And I'm pretty sure that he had to sign some sort of non-disclosure. 
So I haven't pushed my brother at all. Not at all. Um, I'm grateful he lets me ramble at him. And I'm grateful that out of my entire family, he still speaks to me. So, uh, my dad, when he was, he tells a story about when he was in Hawaii. First half of his uh, service time was uh, stationed in Germany as a helicopter mechanic. The hmm. second half was as a helicopter pilot after flight school uh, stationed in Hawaii. Um, all of this happened in the 70s. Okay, my and brother was in Hawaii in the 80s. Okay, my dad was out by then. I think it was either late 70s, early 80s is when he got out. Um, anyway, he tells this story about the big island, the, uh, the volcano uh, opening. He would, uh, now as a helicopter pilot, you know, he knows that whole airspace. And there were times when he would see these, these shiny disks where light would gleam off of them, just kind of orbiting around the, the mouth of the uh, volcano and they would fly in and, and other times you'd see them flying out and, and he, he remembers seeing this stuff. Yeah. Um, I know that I think it was around the time I was a teenager is when his activity was declassified. Um, he basically guarded the transport of nuclear ordnance from the naval ships to the underground facility when they were docked at port. And when they were ready to leave port, the nuclear weapons would be retransported from the underground facility back to the ships. And he flew um, helicopter gunship, um, some, he flew Hueys. And he would have a gunner on each side and he would have a um, bunch of Marines inside. And the Air Force would, um, um, provide, you know, higher altitude surveillance. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, basically the Navy was providing the, uh, the task that needed to be done. So it was an all branches wide operation. Um, his job was if that transport stopped for any reason, no matter what it was, you were to immediately land, let the Marines off, the Marines would surround the transport and you would provide um, air support for those Marines. And there weren't many um, units at the time with this standing order. I mean, okay. he was literally told, it doesn't matter if it's a school bus full of nuns, if they come within this um, distance of those nuclear weapons, you are to shoot immediately and ask questions later. And there will be no prisoners taken. Now there are some situations that are like, exactly this like that. On the Hawaiian islands that he had those standing orders. The only thing that my brother ever said about what he did was that he was on a crew that did maintenance on Air Force planes. So he was one of the guys in the shop. I have no idea yeah. if that's even what he really did. <laughs> my dad talks about what he did. He says every time that he thanks God, he never had to take a life. Yeah. I don't know if my brother had to or not, but my other brother was used as a, a sniper um, when he was in the army. And he was technically a diesel engine mechanic for the army. And he was stationed in, in on the DMZ in, in Korea. 
and <laughs> he got ran over by a tank. Oh no. <laughs> Um, he talks about, yeah, that, that he and his guy, that the tank stalled and he had to work on the engine. And, and he said that um, the guy inside didn't know where he was, started the engine, and it just sucked him right under. Oh. So he, he, uh, he also had problems with he, he was doing black marketing and he ended up in the brig for a while. Yeah, that'll do it. You know, <clears throat> people in my family, we are either ultra religious to the point of being priests, preachers, that kind of people, or we go completely the other way. And my brothers are one of each. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it is. Um, I have two sisters. One of them runs a business that does graphic arts for um, advertising companies. And the other one is a school teacher. So most of us ha are self-supporting stay out of jail kind of people and then there's my brother <laughs> he's in montana and uh, i found where he is on the registers and i i checked to make sure he's still alive but i don't take i don't make contact because i don't want him to show up here i mean when he's when i say he's on the other side i mean it uh, the last time he came to my area, we still had a Kmart and he had stolen some goods from a Kmart and he basically pulled the clerk at our store over the counter and said, you are going to give me cash back for these. So uh, he left before he was arrested, but he, he's a violent man. So now, have any of these guys also been to space? I don't know. It's usually common for if you're in space, your whole family went. Yeah, that's that's the usual. Um, two of us have the small, two of my siblings and I have the small. Uh, malformations that go with uh, Draco DNA. I, I was born with Havertos, uh, so was one of my brothers. And one of my sisters has a curled over ear, which is another common defect that goes with uh, Draco DNA. I think I'm the only one of my mom's children that um, shares her defects. Okay. Now, nobody else, in, n none of my, neither of my parents or their siblings had these issues. This was all us. So this was, this was definitely something our generation that happened. And uh, we were born in the, the late 50s, early 60s. So would they someday wake up to these memories? Possibly. My mom was born early 50s. So she was just a little ahead of me. By a year. Yeah. No, I didn't think I was the first. Um, I know talking to Misha, she has memories of, of being in Monarch before I was born. And she's the same age as, as Lou. So um, I don't share publicly about Lou. He's not public. He's a private person. Right. So um, the only thing I share publicly is that he is an Iroquois shaman and he helps me with 
um, alter reintegration. <clears throat> and I don't think I could have done it without him. So we've got about 15 minutes left. There, is there anything you really want to get in this one? Uh, nothing in particular. You know me. I'm just, I just go with the flow. Yeah. Um, we, we, covered, we covered some good stuff in this one. We covered um, that religion is, is a problem, that money is a problem, that ICC. Outside the earth. Yeah, that ICC is a problem, that that human behavior off-world is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Basically, we have a lot of problems. Yeah, we have a lot of problems, and most of the solutions have to do with us coming back home to Earth and leaving everybody else alone until we grow up as a species. Um my understanding from the guardians is that we're going to be allowed to settle like the Oort cloud, but that basically all the humans that have been out there are going to be sealed inside the solar system and our portals will be closed. So we, the story I got was you're going to be stuck in there until you can live together in peace. Now, if they're going to do that, I've had the, every time you bring that up, every time other people bring that up, I, I always have this thought. We're very adaptable and ingenuitive race. If they're going to do that, they're going to, have to work a lot harder than they think they will because we will always find a way oh yeah we have always found a way out of any trap they're gonna it's gonna find another way out well we have this this combi we have this combination of baby souls that don't really know what the rules are and and criminal souls that are used to finding the rules and breaking them. And you put those two together and you're going to be trouble. Now, the other thing that they've told me is that once we reach a point where we're stable and everybody's here, that we will be offered the opportunity for the galactic police guardians to become our foster parents as a species basically they're going to be shoving the jahami who have been doing a piss poor job aside shoving the jahami aside who are also going to be trapped in the solar system with us by the way yeah that well, they're going to I'm shove agree. them aside and say and you're they're going to say your crappy parents were taking your place we're going to teach your kids how to be reasonable galactic citizens and you're not going to be allowed to mess with them anymore but you're still going to have to live together in peace and this is going to be put to a vote and it will be 50% plus one who wins I was also told that this has been offered to us for times in the past and we have always said no because the first rule is we have to meet the criteria for a level zero civilization which means every sentient being on the planet has to have their survival needs met and, and we yeah. have this cultural religious thing that you have to earn your keep and the two clash well it's not just that it's the it's their definition of what a sentient being is is not what the majority of humanity oh no a sentient being is you behind me you look in a mirror 
And you who's know it's there? you. She knows who's looking back at her. She's considered a sentient being. Exactly. Which means you cannot eat her. If you're a sentient being, you cannot eat them. That is right. Galactic law. So there are animals that we use for food that would be in that category. There are animals that we hunt regularly that are in that category. Um, I, I can, off the top of my head, whales, dolphins, wolves, bears, dairy cattle, cats, dogs, um, all the great apes, Elephants, of course. Elephants, of course. They're, um, they're far more intelligent than people want to believe. Of course they are. And, and it's based on the concept of when they look in the mirror, do they know it's, they know it's their self? They're, that's them looking back at themselves. If they recognize yeah. that they are considered by galactic law a sentient being. If they yes. do not recognize that, they're fair game. Exactly. And that's that's a big, big, big deal to humans who think they're the pinnacle of creation and the only things that have a soul. Because they're using this phrase in the Bible of God telling Adam to go out and take dominion over the land. But what was really going on was um the homo capensis the red-haired giants creators saying we've created you as the managers of earth go manage the slaves yeah that planet. was what was really being said That's but no they don't they don't want they don't want to believe in the red-haired -haired giants they don't want to believe in the homo capensis they don't want to believe that the elites are actually the remnants of another race that was actually put in charge of us. If you have any red hair in your heritage or green or blue eyes, you are descended of red haired giants. Yeah. It's just I know that, you know that. Lot. And I'm hearing lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pure bullshit about blood types, about racial groups, about who's superior to who. And I'm just sitting back going. There is no human more superior than the other. And uh, on any definition these days, we're all in the same pot. The, yeah. the genetics have been so um intertwined between um groups across the world that there really is no such thing as a pure human there is no such thing as a really a difference on the genetic level no well there are some genetic ch differences by how much of the red-haired giants you still have or not there's that um, but I had my <clears throat> DNA done on Ancestry. I did the medical DNA, so it was a fuller representation. Right. And then I took the I took the PDF and uploaded it to uh, the site that compares you to ancient groups. They had, I think it was thirty bodies from archaeological sites <laughs> five of those bodies that were five thousand years old matched me closer than my first cousins wow so i'm starting to wonder where they got the dna that they used on us in the programs how much other did they use on us? Is that why we have abilities, deformities, higher intelligence on, on the usual? And, you know, is that why I match up to these five dead bodies 5,000 years old? 
and I'm like, hmm. First cousin, that's that's as that's nearly that that's nearly a sibling um, um, level of a difference. Yeah, it's nearly a sibling to these people that have been dead for five thousand years, which makes me wonder. You know, uh, two of them were from the British Isles, and three, two of them were from the middle of Europe, and one was from the Middle East. You know, that's quite a spread, too, which unless it happened on purpose, like CRISPR tech, I'm having a hard time figuring out how that happened. So, yes, everything I have ever studied as an adult has come together in my experience of the SSP. My, my personal family tree my personal genetics, I've studied um, archaeology, I've studied history, I've studied physics, mathematics, astronomy. It has all come together in who was taken for these black ops, what they served in, and the science that's used in them. And that's mind-boggling that I was drawn to those particular topics i was drawn to all those topics too i was drawn to the topics that involve um the little little blurbs here and there of one piece of this technology one piece of that technology that they let the public know about and all of a sudden i'm noticing it's like wait a second that fits here does this and i'm yeah. like i remember that yeah a lot of the stuff that I talked about in 2016 and 2017. Folks, if you want to look up the original interviews, it was on YouTube under a group called Reality Brief. I did several interviews talking about the technologies that I was used to using. And within two years, the Basic patents for those technologies have been released. Yep. That did, you, did you notice that after I did after I talked about the uh, the fusion uh, the crystal fusion reactors the batteries? Um, I think it was within a couple of months. Um, there was all this talk suddenly online about somebody inventing a nuclear diamond battery. Yeah, I did notice that. You were talking about the crystal batteries. I described in detail how to produce a fusion, a crystal fusion battery, and then suddenly a nuclear diamond battery shows up in the news. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of the technologies that we describe, they'll change the name. But some of them, they've only changed a single letter, like the Neuralink. Well, that, that what is when people are when when people are remembering and they talk about the, the crystal free energy technology that are powering our ships. No, the, that's this. Yeah. That's the fusion batteries and the diamond batteries. And then that energy is fed into a coil or something to magnify it. There are certain coil geometries that will magnify both voltage and amperage. They're not transferring one to the other. They're magnifying both, creating, yes, an over unity effect because what's mm -hmm. going on is they're drawing in, they're creating a siphon and drawing in further power from the surrounding atmosphere. But yeah, that's what's actually happening when people are remembering and uh, they think it's, it's a free energy crystal power source. No. no. A fusion battery or a diamond battery that can last longer than your lifetime. Diamond batteries, you can design that last longer than your lifetime, but they won't put out as much as a fusion battery will. Hmm. Fusion battery, you can make them last five to 10 years, um, depending on you know what you need to power it, but 
for the volume size, taking up volume space on the ship, a fusion battery is far um, more energy efficient as far as volume taken up on the ship and will put out more power than a nuclear reactor. Or, you know, and it'll put out about the same amount of power as that Navy fusion um, reactor patent. And it's actually more stable. Well, if you take the amount of volume of space taken up on the ship by all the different systems of one of those fusion reactors, and you fill that volumetric space with a fusion battery, a crystal fusion battery, it's going to put out the same amount, but it's also safer and more stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one thing the Germans learned after the Hanabu and Diglaka engines was that stay safer and stable mattered. Yeah, and they started looking at it was the Germans. We got their hand-me-downs. Um, Silicon Valley, as they called it, that was where they sent their hand-me-downs. Mm -hmm. They didn't want any more. Yeah. They, they worked on, they started researching how different kinds of elements doped into quartz, pure silicone quartz, would react. Mm -hmm. and that's how they came up with all these different things. And there are, there are even other crystals um, that they were able to dope and figure out how they work. I'm actually trying to figure out, I, I'm starting to remember that we did have the ability, it was a type of um, artificially developed crystal that when you bombarded it with something, what came out was an antiproton. What broke off of it was an antiproton. That's literally where Gene Rodmary got the idea for dilithium crystals in their nuclear, in their, in their um, antimatter warp reactors. And these put out far more power than the crystal fusion reactors using deuterium. Um, so I'm, I'm working it out. Good. Well, we have hit that time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me again. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> my surgery got postponed till Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th. So I have, an, I have assignments of special scrubs to remove any chance of um, MRSA in my system. So I will be spending this next week prepping for surgery. So this is the last live interview I'm doing before surgery. So after this one is played, the rest will be reruns until I come back. So thank everyone for, for your support and for sticking with me while I get this done.